Welcome from uh, Dean Vijay Kumar. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Vijay Kumar. I'm the Dean of Pan Engineering. Uh, not, the, I don't have, I've not yet been promoted to the Dean of Computer Information <laughs> Science, like it says in your agenda. Um, but on behalf of the university, uh, it just gives me a great pleasure to, to welcome all of you as we uh, pay tribute to an extraordinary friend um, and colleague, uh, Arvind Joshi. It's so, so amazing to see all of you. I see people from different times, from different countries, and uh, all coming together uh, in a way that it's, it's just, it's a little overwhelming. Um, um, but not surprising, because we're all here because of one man, Arvind Joshi, um, because of a shared love and respect uh, that we have for him, uh, his work uh, as a beloved mentor, as a revered teacher, uh, a scientist, a researcher, a friend, uh, as a colleague, uh, a husband, and a father. Um, and I think we'll all agree that Arvind's gentle nature, his intellectual curiosity, his collegiality, he was a consummate colleague um, and mentor to me when I first came to Penn. Um, it, it, it really is, uh, you know, all these qualities have touched all of us. Um, so usually in events like this, you know, somebody stands up in front and uses terms like uh, he or she was a giant in the field. Um, words like extraordinary, um, seminal contributions, and everybody tries to look impressed, and, 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 but secretly inside you, 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 you think that this is all exaggeration. Surely these words don't mean anything. Uh, but in this case, these are the right words. In fact, they are the perfect words. Um, Arvind was a giant uh, in his field. I think through his long and distinguished career, he did make seminal contributions uh, in the area of linguistics, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, natural language processing. Um, thanks to him, uh, terms like tree adjoining grammars and uh, center line theory are all now parts of our vernacular. Uh, we all have embraced uh, uh, these words. Um, We'll no doubt hear from many of you about his extraordinary um, uh, achievements, um, and, but it, you know, it's not an exaggeration to say that he's won pretty much all the, the premier, the, the, all the prestigious honors in his field, uh, not just in computer science, but more broadly, computer science and engineering. Um, but to me, uh, the word that I use uh, that he really defined was the word interdisciplinary. At Penn, we pride ourselves on interdisciplinary research to the point that now it's a buzzword. But we have to go back to when he first came up with the field that I think it's attracted so many of you uh, to realize he's the one who, who actually coined that word. And so at Penn, we say interdisciplinary is in our DNA. Actually, it was in Arvind's DNA. And that got transmitted uh, to all of us. Um, there's also no exaggeration when I say, uh, and I think Mark Liverman's blog summarized this very well, you go to any part of the world where computational linguistics is done and, and you will see that Arvind has touched that laboratory, that, that research and development group. Um, in fact, if there were, you know this uh, logo that you have Intel inside with Intel, you know, Intel starts putting it on things to show that Intel is behind a lot of the innovation. So if you go to computational linguistic web pages, I feel like we should have a logo Aravind inside because <laughs> you know, it's, it's his work that's reflected there. Um, so just one recent personal story. I invited uh, Aravind's, one of early uh, Aravind's uh, uh, doctoral students, uh, Jerry Kaplan, who is now at Stanford. He's written this great book. Um, it's, it's called Humans Need Not Apply, A Guide to Wealth and Work in the a Age of AI. So I invited him to be our doctoral commencement speaker, and he said he would come for two hours. He would fly in on a red eye, do, do the speech, and then leave. He only had one request. He wanted an hour of quality time with Arvind Joshi. And of course, I said, sure. I, I promised, to him, promised to him this hour like it was my hour. But I knew Arvind would be delighted uh, to do this. Um, 
and little did I know that he would not get this hour, uh, but, but this just shows you that there are people who don't do computational linguistics, who have been touched by Aravind, who really know him and who, who feel for him. Um, I know Bonnie's standing there and glaring at me because she told me my job is to just welcome all of you and not to keep <laughs> speaking. And I think I've done that. Um, uh, I know there are many of you that are much closer to him than, than I ever was. Uh, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts, your memories about him. Thank you very much. So our first main presentation will be from uh, Shamala Joshi and Mira Joshi. And Ava Joshi. <laughs> and Marco. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Just wanted to give a few brief words of my memories with Arvind Zoshi, or as I referred to him, Appa. From great excursions all around the world to simple tutoring sessions in his study, Appa always had a way of making every moment special in his own quirky way. I mean, for such an intelligent man, it was funny how he struggled with the littlest of things. I still remember the day he took a silicon packet out of a wrap sandwich and proceeded to use it as seasoning. <laughs> and how he'd put sriracha on everything, including his pancakes. Uh, without a grandfather like Appa in my life, I would have missed out on so much culture, academics, humor. But Arvin was much more than a grandfather to me. He was a mentor, an inspiration, and a constant stream of joy and happiness. And I know his legacy will live on in all of our hearts. Hey everybody, I'm Shamala. Thank you all for coming. Um, all right. Um, so, yeah, Appa didn't like big speeches, especially those that went on and on. So in his honor, we'll keep this brief. Here's what he did like. Appa loved his work. He loved every aspect about it, but especially the people, his colleagues and students. He respected you all, and in turn, you inspired him. We knew this already. But it was particularly apparent when we started to sift through the years and years of photos as we put things together. Every photo related to work, Appa has a giant grin on. <laughs> he was so happy doing what he did with you guys. Um, this is the environment where he really was truly happy. Um, but this love of work often got him into trouble at home. <laughs> it drove mom crazy. Almost every night, while cooking dinner, invariably she'd mutter, where's Irvind, where's Irvind? <laughs> Followed by, girls, with one of you, will one of you please call your father in the office? Find out when he's coming home. Then there would be a second demand. Tell him dinner's ready. Tell him it's getting cold. Eventually we'd hear the click click of his uh, keys at the door and, and things would settle down. But um, he loved to stay late in the office. Um, and Appa loved mum. I don't have enough time or adequate language to tell you about how much she loved you, but you know that. Appa loved cats. <laughs> he was so fond of the Zoshi tabbies. The most recent one, Shira, was no exception. Every morning, the first thing he'd ask mom was, where's Shira? Shira sat lovingly by his side till the very end. There are a few other quirky things that he loved. There was a red parka. Some of you may be familiar with <laughs> He would trust nobody to wash this. It had to be washed in the, in the dark of night. Um, there was a blue parka that had the same situation and another red parka, but there was generally, I think, three. There was um, the pair of good dress shoes. These were bought during their honeymoon. <laughs> they were shelled. And um, he broke them out several decades later at Mira's graduation. <laughs> Much to his surprise, they disintegrated on the stage of the academy. <laughs> but these were good shoes. <laughs> and he had to shuffle across the stage to give Mira his, her diploma. This actually happened again with his other, his backup pair of good shoes, which probably never been worn. They also combusted at another event that Mira had to present something at. <laughs> 
Anyway, that's the end of the good shoes. But um, the, these good shoes are hanging soulless in one of his closets because he, he was really sentimental about these things. Um, uh, and Appa loved us. We know that. Um, but as kids, we never really understood the significance of his contributions to computer science and linguistics. We just figured that other fathers played games like diagram this sentence. <laughs> or tell me what John saw the man-eating tiger means to you. There was a few more sentences he asked us, but um, despite his best efforts, our ability to master computer programming was limited. Let me show you. Binary cards were useful as art supplies <laughs> and sticking cats on. <laughs> And uh, yeah, our programming notes speak for themselves. <laughs> They're available for your peer review upon request. <laughs> Thank you. There were some lessons that Appa taught us that we did actually grasp and we hold on to every day. <laughs> the importance of your siblings. <laughs> While grateful to have had the education he had involved sacrifice, <laughs> he was separated from his parents and brothers when he was young so he could get a better education in Pune, and he never really lived with them for any significant length of time afterwards. As an adult, and certainly in the last few decades, he strengthened his relationship with his brother Ravi, sharing memories of their childhood through frequent visits <laughs> and FaceTime conversations where both brothers only showed the upper half of their heads, <laughs> no matter how many times we encouraged them to lower their phones. <laughs> It reminds Shamla and I to always stick together. Some other lessons. Don't boast. Appa disliked what he called Pratani people. <laughs> That's his word for pretenders. He also used it to describe us. <laughs> when we wanted to get out of school, we were Pratani sick or Pratani crying. <laughs> he gave generously. He gave to each and every charity request that appeared in our mailbox year after year. There was no sifting through to determine the worthiness of the cause. If they asked, he gave. Don't step on books and don't throw books. Don't go to bed angry or with scratches in the brain. That's his famous phrase to describe how he felt when he was annoyed. Usually that's because we were annoying him. <laughs> And probably the most important lesson of all, that there's something remarkable about every single person. Appa was in awe of the people around him, whether it was how someone filled up a gas tank, stacked boxes, or cut vegetables. People's processes fascinated him and allowed him to see everyone with a level of equity that few others are gifted with. I'll end with the good night that we g used as a family growing up. Om, Om Shanti Shanti, Shanti and, and peace, peace be with, with you. you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Gautam. My, my father, Prakash, and Arvind were cousins. Their, their mothers were sisters. And I want to thank Susan Kaku for having me speak here. Um, I, I was fortunate to stay with Appa and Susan Kaku for two wonderful years when I was in dental school at Penn. Um, 
and I can tell you nobody makes ginger tea as well as he did. <laughs> and I had to threaten to go on a hunger strike for him to let me do the dish, load the dishwasher because there's a science to it that only he knows <laughs> and nobody else. Um, I first-hand experienced the where is Professor Zoshi rants every day and the conversation that happened every day for two years was, Arvind, where are you? When she had called the office and he would say, I'm on the bus. And she would hang up and look at me and say, yeah, right, as if they have the office phone in the bus. <laughs> two years, never ended. Um, we've heard Shamla and Meera refer to two things. One was family. Um, Appa was, along with Susan Kaku, of course, was personally responsible largely for three members of his family getting their doctorate degrees at Penn. My dad's elder brother, uh, late Vishwas Govitrikar, who did a PhD, and uh, they actually hosted him for eight years. I don't think they hosted Shamla and Meera for eight years. <laughs> And they loved their family so much, he loved his family so much, they took another member of the Govitrikar family to live with them uh, when I stayed. And then Sunil Shende, are you here? Uh, Sunil Shende, another family member, did his PhD. So three members of the family right here at Penn. So we thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll end with an incident that showed us, coming, growing up in India, Appa was, you know, like God. Uh, it literally he was the reincarnation of God in the in the family, but he showed his human humorous side when me and my sister came to visit for the first time, and uh, uh, Granny was at the wheel of the <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Granny was at the wheel of their land uh, land cruiser, and me and my sister Gayatri are sitting in the back, and we all know Appa with his backpack walking, you know, like this. And he, he's driving, he's walking, comes out of the house and starts going behind the car to get to the passenger side. And Granny honks and points to come in this way. So he comes in, she goes, I, I was telling you to come and sit from this side. He goes, never walk in front of a uh, moving car, or a car that is running. And Granny says, yeah, like as I'm going to run you over. And he said, you never know. <laughs> that to me epitomized him. Thank you. We miss you. Thank you, Bonnie. Many of you know that Aravind was our living link to the origins of our department. He did his PhD and came up through the ranks at Penn, starting as an assistant professor in, in, in electrical engineering and linguistics in 1961. He was a member of the then graduate group of computer and information science, which was formed within the EE in 1959, and from which the first PhDs in computer science in this country came. Aravind was then instrumental in the formation of our department, which was created by 1972. He served as the chair for an amazing 14 years, exhibiting true grace, wisdom, and vision. We're going to hear more about a theory as to why he was chair for 14 years when Mitch speaks. <laughs> a guiding principle of Aravind's early hires was that they have a fit within some contacts at Penn, whether that was within or outside the department. So his focus really was interdisciplinary before it became the topic of many presidents and provosts' agendas. He pulled the department together under the themes of artificial intelligence and cognitive science and obtained umbrella funding from the Sloan Foundation, the Army Research Office, and the National Sound, uh, Science Foundation. These programs involved the majority of the faculty of the department at the time, 
strengthened their in interdisciplinary bonds, expanded the PhD student population, and seeded the creation of locally controlled computing resources. You have to remember that computers weren't ubiquitous back then, right? <laughs> So I'm going to end with my personal perspective before asking Mitch to come up. Because Aravind had a huge impact on my career. He quietly advocated for women in computer science. His, among his first hires was the first female faculty in our school, Ruzhin Abaichi. He hired me when I was six months pregnant, visibly and unsure as to whether I could handle a family and a career. Many institutions that I applied to said I couldn't. But Aravind saw that I could, and he not only did that, hire me, but he gave me a part-time visiting position for the first year so that the tenure clock would not start. This is before, again, you have to remember, this was the time before they had family-friendly policies at Penn. There was no tenure extension for women with families. His use of the umbrella funding that I alluded to earlier was essentially gave me a startup package at a time that this university did not have startup packages. And so that enabled me to go to conferences, have PhD students before I obtained my own funding. All of this was done without fanfare or expecting anything in return. He did it because it was the right thing. So when I was department chair around 2000, a guest invited as a distinguished speaker stopped by my office. He had been one of the very first PhD recipients from our department. He finished a few years before the department was formed actually and right before Aravind became chair. This fellow was still quite angry about his treatment here as a graduate student, and he told me how difficult many of our faculty had been. After listening carefully, I surprised him no end by thanking him for giving me the crucial piece to solve an old mystery that I couldn't solve. Why had Aravind, given the remarkable scientific work that he himself was doing, been willing to serve as department chair for 14 years. 14 years. But now I understood, I told him. Aravind was like Moses in the desert, leading the Israelites for 40 years until the generation of slaves who had left Egypt had died off and been replaced by their free children. For the sake of the future, Aravind was willing to wait out that difficult generation, doing his best for 14 years to hire only collegial, decent, thoughtful people, successfully creating the environment that, of course, still exists. And one more story. When I came here, I came here in 87 from Bell Labs, I certainly knew Aravind's almost paralleled stature within natural language processing. But I didn't understand at all that he was the bedrock of this entire department. But at a faculty meeting soon after I arrived, a discussion about some important issue became heated. People completely stopped listening to each other. Then, for the first time at that meeting, Aravind spoke. He spoke quietly, he spoke briefly, and his words were filled with wisdom. And that was it. The contention vanished, and the issue was simply resolved. And this happened again and again. A few quiet, clear, deeply wise words from Aravind, and some contentious issue was just resolved. All of this, plus Aravind's ever-present twinkle, of course, played a major role in making this a place that I and many folks came to and have remained for decades and decades. I, I miss him very much. Okay, so that was 
CIS. And now Lila Gleitman will talk about Arvind and his work at IRCS. Well, I have a new mystery for you, given something uh, I heard today. Uh, I now know that Arvin was always late getting home for dinner. Uh, and I figured he liked it at home so much that he couldn't get himself to go to work. <laughs> so it sounds more like he liked being wherever he was. <laughs> I wonder what he was doing in between being. Uh, uh, ERCS, the Institute for Research in Cognitive Science at Penn, uh, began, I suppose, as a glimmer in the eye of Zaley Harris, uh, who foresaw uh, a computational theory of language. Uh, and to uh, implement this, um, uh, we luckily we had this um, primitive machine that occupied the written house uh, uh, building first floor, uh, which was the Univac. Uh, I think the second incarnation uh, uh, of Univac, uh, in which to implement uh, 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 this kind of idea. So um, Harris, I was a first year student. Uh, in um, linguistics at that time. Uh, maybe it was about 1959, something of that sort. Uh, and uh, he said to me, you're going to do language on a computer. To which I said, what's a computer? <laughs> he said, it's all right. I have somebody who will show you. Uh, and he's a young professor, uh, assistant professor in the uh, uh, electrical engineering department uh, named Arvind Joshi. So I went over there. Uh, I went over there, over here somewhere around here where there was the Moore School, uh, and we were introduced uh, uh, to each other, and I was totally astonished uh, to find out from Arvind what a computer was. Now, he wasn't really as astonished to find out what a language was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he had other experience uh, 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 of that. Uh, but I was astonished. He was instantly captivated uh, uh, by the idea uh, of, um, uh, uh, of doing computation linguistics, at least so he promptly invented it. Uh, and... Um, uh, it's a very vivid experience uh, in my life. Uh, it's changed my life uh, and career. Uh, it established a uh, bond uh, uh, of work and colleagueship with uh, Arvind Joshi that uh, lasted un uh, till this very day and will always last. Uh, and uh, Arvin then began to uh, actually design um, uh, a, a theory that analyzed language on a machine. Uh, and in retrospect, he called that, some of you will know, he, uh, it really worked very well. It really was a parser. In retrospect, he called it the parser from antiquity. Uh, and it worked pretty well, given the teeny little computational resources uh, that existed uh, uh, at, uh, at that time. Uh, at th then Arvin began to generalize uh, 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 the idea of a computational theory of mind, uh, and many faculty uh, from, mainly from this university, but from several of the places to uh, began uh, uh, to think in this interdisciplinary vein with uh, Joshi leading the parade uh, uh, in every way. I know that some of the people in this room uh, uh, were there uh, at that time. And um, so reading groups developed 
and faculty began to work with each other, always with this gentle, invisible hand, uh, but relentless, uh, of Joshi driving this uh, interdisciplinary idea. And after many years, he said to me and others, you know, we have to get some financial support for this if it's really going to go through. And then he gently and relentlessly accomplished that too. As has just been mentioned, uh, uh, we got a seed grant uh, from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation somewhere in the uh, 80s when they were beginning uh, uh, to think about uh, uh, actualizing a, um, a, a cognitive science. Uh, and then, uh, fortuitously, at this time, the National Science Foundation uh, uh, funded or, or decided to fund uh, about 25 uh, big institutes uh, uh, with enormous, what seemed at least enormous at the time, uh, amounts of, of um, uh, 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 funds uh, to support uh, large program projects in various universities. And all of these things were perfectly sensible. Certain advances in physics and the usual suspects uh, all got this money. Uh, and improbably, uh, under Joshi's leadership, we applied for this. And it was completely weird as far as um, uh, uh, as far as NSF was concerned, uh, I don't know how we ever got that grant, because they kept saying, well, the physicists are going to do such and such. What did you say you were going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, ba basically what I have said is we're going to create a field. Um, we're going to create the field of cognitive science. And to do so, we have to um, train a new generation of scientists who will be comfortable in this cross-discipline. Uh, unlike us, who were amateurs on one side, uh, and it was really too late to change completely. Uh, but young scientists could be trained and have been uh, and that interdisciplinary work flourished here at Penn and at some other places as well. Uh, uh, but improbably, as I say, Penn received this grant uh, that established a center for cognitive science uh, and um, called the Institute for Research in Cognitive Science. And it was wonderful. And Arvin said to me, you know, um, if we're going to make this thing work, we have to embed ERCs inside uh, uh, the university, inside undergraduate programs, because if it doesn't get inside the undergraduate as well as graduate program, when the money runs out 10 years from now, It'll be, I remember him saying this, it'll be like running your finger through a bowl of water. When the money goes, it will be gone. Uh, and therefore, it's remarkable the things he thought of to do with that money that we had, all in the way of making connections. I would enumerate them for you, except that, that it would take too long. But supporting co-teaching, uh, bringing faculty uh, from all over the world uh, um, uh, and establishing the uh, weekly colloquium, which drew students and faculty from all over the university unerringly uh, to study this interdisciplinary, uh, were among the innovations uh, that he thought of uh, and never stopped. Uh, thinking about. So he, he created uh, cognitive science 
in so many ways, intellectually we know and other people have spoken about it, uh, but administratively and as an organic uh, uh, active field, there's nobody, I think, uh, uh, who contributed as creatively, as relentlessly, as I say, and as generally uh, as um, as Aaron, Aaron did uh, for his lifetime. Uh, I will always hold him as a dear colleague uh, and as a dear friend, uh, and I very much mourn his loss uh, today with all of you. So, good night to Sweet Irvin. The, n the next four talks on the program are going to address Arvin's continuing legacy in many of the fields that he was an early, I don't want to say early adopter, <laughs> he was an early starter on. And so the first of the people who will talk about Arvin's uh, continuing legacy is Bob Frank from Yale University to talk about his work in grammar and parsing. So thanks to Bonnie for all of her very hard work in putting this together and for all the others who helped out. It's an enormous honor and um, pleasure to be able to say some words about Aravind and um, all that he did for, for me and for all of us who are here um, and, and to remember him. Uh, he, it's, it's very, very difficult for me to overstate just how important Aravin was um, in my life. And it, I sort of jokingly think that I've even modeled my hairstyle after his. Um, <laughs> that uh, as you know, I, did, I knew that he'd been chair for a long time. I've now heard that he was chair for 14 years. I'm just finishing my eighth year as department chair. So I'm trying to follow him in that respect as well. Um, but I think also uh, intellectually, uh, M the entire way that I see the world is very much, as Lila said, that I was very much the beneficiary of this insight and this way of conceptualizing the world that Aravind um, brought us uh, out of the desert to see, as Mitch said, and um, I'm extremely grateful about that. So I um, didn't know whether people were just going to be talking or have slides, and as an academic, I'm sort of just tempted to show slides, so I will. Um, so, you know, we all have lots of memories of Aravind, um, some personal, so we all remember his kindness, his humility, his ability to make people feel comfortable at an instant, um, his unerring support of all of his colleagues and his students, um, uh, his boundless curiosity and his energy till the, till the end. Um, it was remarkable that he would call, up, call me up and want to tell me about his latest idea and share this and how excited he was and the glint that would come through his eye when he had some new idea that he wanted to tell you about. Um, as Lila just talked about, this commitment to walk, working across disciplinary boundaries was really remarkable and that, re that was a, a real model for me. Um, the one thing I want to talk about today though was, was something that was really impressive to, um, to those of us who were his graduate students. Um, and. Uh, you know, Ar Arvin was a quiet man and would not be someone who would be showy and you wouldn't go into your office and have a meeting with him where you felt like, okay, he just showed you the answer. He just told you how this whole thing was going to solve. You'd go in and you would sort of convene and he would be quiet and, you know, he would throw a few words and you would be kind of puzzled. But time after time after time, he would always have the sense of, knowing exactly how to define the problem in the way that will allow you to make progress and exactly the way in which a solution should be formulated to guarantee the most insight. And this kind of astonished us. How could someone be so lucky, right, all the time? But he had this unerring sense of what was an insightful solution. And I think it comes down to, I was trying to think about this as two adjectives, elegance and practicality. So I think what Aravind was, was um, if not in his dress, um, perhaps otherwise uh, was committed to elegance um, so let me talk a little bit about both elegance and practicality. Um, I hope, oh, this does work. So as you know, um, a lot of his, his, his most well-known work, it, it 
centers around these two frameworks that uh, were already mentioned, tree adjoining grammar and centering theory. And both of these involve trying to use a kind of formal system to get the right kind of formal system, the most elegant kind of formal system that captures the kind of patterns that we see. Okay? And you know, um, you, some of you who are in the field know that this comes out of the work of someone else who was a Penn graduate, Chomsky, who developed this hierarchy of grammars, the finite state, context-free, context-sensitive, and recursively enumerable grammars. And there was a lot of work in the 60s and 70s and up to the early 80s of trying to figure out where in this formal system natural language actually stood in particular in the domain of syntax. Where did syntax actually fall? And as again was also mentioned, Aravind had some early work um, that Lila mentioned, this parser from antiquity, which examined the possibility that language could actually reside at the very lowest rung of this, of this hierarchy. Um, there was some arguments that a young Noam Chomsky gave suggesting that this might not be the right thing, um, this suggested, well, maybe we want to move up the ladder to the context free. Then um, a, a more youthful than that, Stuart Schieber, um, argued uh, that we actually need something more than that as well. Okay? Um, Chomsky then, again, this is the youthful Chomsky, having predicted that Schieber would have found this some years hence, um, said, well, look, what we really need is this very powerful system of transformational grammars, and we're, that's going to give us some lovely analyses. But the unfortunate consequence of adopting that system was that it was extraordinarily powerful. It didn't meet la natural language at the natural seams. It was basically saying we should have a general purpose computer to analyze language. And what Erevin's great insight was, was to say, well, hold your horses. Maybe what we should do is try to have a more restricted system, which is going to deal with Stewart's cases, but it's going to still allow us to have some beautiful elegance, mathematical formal elegance, that will give us some insight to the nature of language. And that was his idea of my mild context sensitivity. Um, so as you know, he instantiated this hypothesis in a particular framework that is now famous, tree drawing grammar. And there were some fundamental insights about that for linguistic description. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Those of you who know, know this. Those of you who don't, probably my saying three words will not be helpful. So. Um, <laughs> So, so there was this work, and that's been, uh, that was the, what I started working on when I came to Penn in a, a long time ago, and, um, <laughs> and uh, what I've been working on since, and I continue to work, I and my students continue to work on this. Um, it's been remarkably productive, and it's been productive in at least three domains. I think it's been a kind of, uh, a kind of banner case of a particular insight that has impacts, really deep impacts, across different disciplines. So in computer science, it's led to this class of computational systems, this hierarchy of grammars that has been really productive, across, not just any longer in Philadelphia or at Penn, but at universities all over the world and is scholars in academics and in industry. Uh, in linguistics, it's had led to a lot of ex very elegant and beautiful explanations of grammatical phenomena, and it's had impact in um, in psychology and modeling, sentence processing, sentence comprehension, language acquisition. Um, so that's the legacy of that work. Um, it's also turned out that Aravind, through his, as, as Mitch said, his quiet comments, quiet but insistent comments, have had the ability to persuade minds who are not often persuaded. So in 1980, um, Chomsky published a book um, called Rules and Representations, in which there was this debate at the time of whether this idea that the conclusion that transformational grammars was extreme, were extremely powerful, was this a bad thing? And Chomsky said, well, we're now asking whether is, there's some reason or, or principle of principle why these grammars must generate recursive sets, that they should be less powerful than the all-powerful Turing machine. No serious argument has ever been advanced in support of this claim. Chomsky, not everyone to have Aravind's modesty. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so what was interesting was, this is 1980, um, in the intervening 25 years, something happened. So a lot of this work in tree adjoining grammar and in constrained grammatical formalisms happened. And I don't think that Chomsky would ever admit this, but if you now read what um, Chomsky wrote in 2005, he says, the principles and parameters approach opened the possibility for serious investigation of the third factor, we won't describe that, and the attempt to account for properties of language, here we go, in terms of general considerations of computational efficiency. So even people who are sort of like freight trains and are never turned, were turned by the gentle force of, of Aravind's arguments. And I think that's really impressive. Um, so let me just say one more thing, if I can get to this. So there was an interesting thing about Aravind. So I said elegance was one adjective. The other adjective was practicality. 
And so, you know, there were different practical sides. I, I didn't know personally, but I knew the Arab and had this place in Pennsylvania that he, that he loved to go. And I imagined him out there with a the tractor. Um, I don't know if this is true. If, I would love to see it. I would love to see a photo of Aaron on the tractor. But, um, and I know also those, those uh, punch cards. He loved to talk about how he used the, the punch cards, that they were the greatest thing. He didn't want to have a, 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 some kind of electronic organizer. That Those were the best thing to write down your, your meeting times and put those in your pockets. That was the ideal size for your shirt. But I think Aravin in general always had this interest in practical applications, and you might worry, right? So if, for those of you who know about the field of natural language processing these days, there's been this revolution, you may have heard, where people are using these neural networks, deep learning, and where they're, in a sense, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. They're saying, we don't need this linguistic stuff, we just need our neural networks and lots of data. And so that one might worry, is this, you know, the sort of this phase transition in the field of natural language processing, is this a mean, mean that Aravind's legacy, at least in that field, is diminished in its, in its consequences? And I don't think that's true. So let me just sort of give a quick advertisement for some work that I and my students have been doing. So, so this, what's on the right is a picture that, again, most of you probably will just look like a bunch of boxes and arrows, because that's what it is. This is a diagram of a parsing algorithm that, that some students and Owen Rambo and I have been uh, investigating, and the idea is we're building a parser for tree and grammar. Okay, so there's nothing incompatible between these architectures and tree and grammar, and that's what we're doing. But what's remarkable about this is that here we've got an architecture where we're asking these, these very complicated networks to do, to solve a task that is a kind of a task where we're Give, saying that the seams are those, the seams of language are the seams that Aravind would have had us believe. And, and so what is astonishing is that, first of all, it works quite well. Thank, that's great. But moreover, it allows us to solve tasks, other kinds of very practical tasks. The thing we've looked at is the task of textual entailment. It enables you to make progress on very practical tasks so that even we can combine this kind of deep learning and, and data-heavy natural language processing with these insights, and they're not necessarily incompatible. And I think that's a, really a legacy going forward for practical natural language processing. So let me say one more thing, um, uh, and this is the last thing. So in the Jewish tradition, we say about um, people who've passed away, they, we say, Zichrono uh, Livracha, may his memory be for a blessing. And um, that's a funny phrase. You're, you're wondering, well, what, what do you mean his, his memory is for a blessing? And so there are kind of two interpretations for this. One is that, well, by, by remembering him, we're blessing, we're honoring the dead. But I think there's another sense of may his memory be for a blessing, that in remembering him, in holding on to what he taught us, we're bringing to the future, we're bringing to everyone else who perhaps didn't have the fortune of knowing him, the, the benefits and all the joys and all the, the love and all the insight that his life brought us. So I remember in his, um, in his office, he had a statue of Ganesh. And so I remember looking up about Ganesh as, and was told that he was the placer and remover of obstacles. And so I think by remembering Aravind, we are helping to remove our own obstacles. He's helping us to remove our own, but also those of our loved ones and the ones that we know. Thank you very much. That, that was lovely. Um, those of you who've looked at Mark Liberman's uh, blog in memoriam to Arvind, know that Arvind also carried out work on computational biology. And that work is now being continued by Lian Huang uh, at the University of Washington, who couldn't be with us, but who's sent us a video. So uh, do we have? Hi, oh, there he is. Huang, and I'm Dr. Joshi's last PhD student. I'm deeply saddened by Arvind's passing, and I'm honored to speak here about his legacy in computational biology. So most people have known Arvind as a pioneer in computational linguistics, but not too many people have known Arvind's work in computational biology, which are also very important. So here's my story. So technically, I was not the last student to have graduated, but I was the last who have entered the program. So in the Chinese tradition, this is called a shut door student which means the advisor shuts the door and admits nobody else. But naturally, as the last student, I should have bared some special responsibility for passing on his legacy. Um, and in indeed I did, because the direction that Aaron assigned me uh, for my thesis was very different from everybody else's. 
This was because around 2001, Aravind discovered a brand new direction and he was super excited about it, where he can apply computational linguistics to structural biology. So this direction was featured very heavily in his uh, award address when he received his ACL Lifetime Achievement Award. He discovered that there are a lot of correspondence or parallels between linguistics and, and biology, where in linguistics, you have sentences like the chef cooks the soup and you have syntactic structures represented as parse trees, um, which can also be modeled by conic figure grammars. In biology, you have also sequences, but instead of English or Chinese sentences, you have RNA or protein sequences, which are made of nucleotides or uh, amino acids. And above the sequences, you also have structures. And the simplest structure is called secondary structure, which can be represented also as parse trees and modeled by context free grammars as well. But more interestingly, the tree adjoining grammars, which everyone was known for, uh, which can model crossing structures in natural language, can also model crossing structures in RNA and protein. And that reminds Aravind that this might have a great potential by connecting these two fields. So he wrote an NSF uh, proposal. It was funded, and he started to recruit students and postdocs for this project at uh, Coding 2002. So I applied, and he accepted me and brought me to Penn. So this project involved two PhD students and one postdoc at Penn. David was the other PhD student, and Julia was the postdoc. We had great collaborators in biology at UCSF. So Ken Dill is basically the Aaron Joshi of protein folding. And we published papers in JCACS, Polymer, Proteins, and other journals. But unfortunately, at the end of the project, David, Julia, and I all went back to focus narrowly on computational linguistics and no longer uh, work on biology. This was much to uh, Aaron's disappointment. Uh, because we did not realize as much as Aaron do the great potential of this interdisciplinary direction. But things took a very interesting turn uh, after I moved to Oregon State. So I did not work on any biology after 2007. But after moving to Oregon State, a colleague of mine who was uh, who is a biology person working on RNA structures asked me, "Do you happen to know like this very complicated term called?" stochastic context-free grammars, which can be used for RNA secondary structure prediction. I was like, wow, this was what my advisor wanted to, me to work on for my PhD. But much to his disappointment, I abandoned that direction. I went back to natural processing and focused narrowly on that. Um, but this conversation reminded me that now, after working on natural processing for so many years, I could come back to biology, I could apply what I've discovered all these years in computational linguistics, and in particular, linear time parsing algorithms, to speed up RNA and protein structure prediction. Because, you know, interestingly, the standard algorithms for uh, RNA secondary structure prediction is indeed a CKY algorithm, which we invented back in the 1960s uh, in computational linguistics. So they were always about 20 years behind computational linguistics. So I immediately realized the great potential of this direction, and I worked on it for the past two years, and it got great results, and we got the first linear time predictor for RNA secondary structures, whereas all the existing ones are cubic time, based on our CKY parsing algorithm from 1960s. But more importantly, the more I work on this direction, the more I realized that Aaron was correct from the very beginning. He was correct 15 years ago. Uh, when he would try to convince me to work on this direction, uh, that this direction uh, has probably more potential and more importance than computational linguistics itself. But now it's my turn to convince my own students to work on this interdisciplinary direction, and it remains a difficult task, just as it was a difficult task when Aravind tried to do that about 20 years ago. So thank you, Aravind. It was a gr great honor to be your last PhD student. And I will continue this direction of applying computational linguistics to structural biology in your honor. And I'll make sure I pass on your legacy to your academic grandchildren. Thank you, Erwin. And thank you, everybody, for your attention. All right, with this, um, Lamont, uh, hold that one. Uh, this is part of uh, a video tribute that will 
go on to after we finish these uh, legacy talks. Um, Susan asked me to talk as well, so I'm going to talk about Arvind's continuing legacy in discourse processing. So we all know how many things fascinated Arvind, and here I want to focus on his uh, research interest in discourse, by which I mean texts and their challenges to readers and listeners. I want to mention them not only because they continue to guide current research in language technology and psycholinguistics, but also because they reveal how Arvind engaged with researchers committed to competing approaches. And two lines of research stand out here. One is his work with colleagues Barbara Gross and Scott Weinstein on centering, and the other is his work on lexicalized discourse structure, centering first. Uh, in addition to elegance, which Bob mentioned, Arvin was always committed to finding simple ways of addressing complex problems, like the amount of inference needed to understand text. There's just too much that speakers assume that listeners can fill in for themselves. Back in the 1970s, he and Steve Kuhn developed centered logic to reduce inferential effort by focusing inference on what could be taken to be the most important entity in the logical statements. This was then further developed by Scott Weinstein here at Penn, and then both by Scott and Barbara and Arvin into a method for monitoring the changing set of entities that were the focus of a text and taking them to be the most likely reference for pronouns like he and she, which don't by themselves say very much about who's being discussed. The Gross, Joshi, and Weinstein paper on centering was first circulated in 1983 and then revised and published in 1995. It stimulated research in psycholinguistics and both research and development in language technology that continue through today. So in psycholinguistics, I would highlight Andy Kaler and Hannah Rohde's recent work on probabilistic reconciliation of coherence-driven and centering-driven theories of pronoun interpretation, which embeds the psycholinguistic results of experiments on what people take pronouns to refer to under different conditions in statements of Bayesian probability. In language technology, centering was radically simplified into what was called the entity grid model of pronoun reference, first in work by Regina Barzile at MIT and Marilla Lapata at Edinburgh, and more recently and elegantly in work by Mikael Strube and his students at Heidelberg, allowing some of the earlier radical simplifications to be lifted. So in centering Arvin's early and compelling insight into language understanding continues to underpin contemporary research, and I see it going forward into the future. As for Arvin's other work in discourse, it too was driven by his commitment to simple ways of addressing complex problems. In this case, the problem of how the stream of clauses and sentences in a text could be taken to make sense together. The model for this was his lexicalized tree adjoining grammar, which, as Bob showed us, posited a grammar made up of units larger than words, and in this case, the units were larger and you could associate semantics of meaning to the larger structures directly. Some of these trees were anchored in explicit words or phrases, while others could only be viewed as having an implicit anchor, but meaning still attached to the tree as a whole. Now this proved to be a productive way of looking at the meaning we attach to sequences of clauses and sentences. Some larger units are anchored in conjunctions like because and but, or adverbials like on the other hand or instead, while other sequence could be seen as units with an implicit anchor that listeners could make explicit of asked. This view, which Arvin and I first laid out in 1998 and was further developed by, with Matthew Stone and Ali Knott, became the basis for an NSF-funded Penn Discourse Tree Bank, 
whose annotation at Penn was overseen by Rashmi Prasad, Eleni Miltsakaki, and Alan Lee, and then released to the community in 2008. The relative simplicity of the Penn Discourse Tree Bank, in terms of what aspects of discourse coherent it was committed to developing a solution to, enabled both international shared tasks on discourse parsing, and these were organized by Bert Schwe at Brandeis, and who is here today too, and the development of similar discourse annotated corpora in Chinese, again led by Bert Schwe, Hindi, led by Dipti Misra Sharma at IIT Hyderabad, Turkish, led by Denise Zarek at Metu in Ankara, and Arabic, and also for biomedical texts, led by Rashmi Prasad, who's sitting in the audience next to Mikhail Strube. More recently, the Pendus Cross Tree Bank has facilitated the development of the TED Multilingual Discourse Bank, in which a set of TED Talks and their parallel translations have been annotated in the style of the Penn Discourse Tree Bank in Portuguese, Turkish, English, German, Russian, Polish, and Lithuanian. And comparing how discourse relations have been realized across texts in these different languages has re been a real eye-opener for everyone concerned with discourse and discourse coherence. Let me close by commenting on what all of this re reveals about how Arvin engaged with researchers committed to competing approaches. When I started, work on discourse was a rat's nest of competing views, with meetings aimed on getting researchers to reconcile approaches, ending with the advocates even less interested in talking with each other. This was the situation pre-Arvind. Arvind always took the most inclusive view possible, that competing approaches bear interesting relations to one another that would come out if only people kept talking together. This was the same view he took with grammar, where the annual conference on tree-adjoining grammar was called not that, but rather tree-adjoining grammar and related formalisms. So this is another of Arvind's enduring legacies to us. Research on any really difficult challenge done on the inclusive flag of and related formalisms is more likely to deliver insights and results than any work done in a silo of a single theory. As Bob said, we'll miss him terribly. Thank you. I'm sorry, with my other hat, let me introduce Mark Steedman, who's going to talk about Arvind's continuing legacy and language complexity. So, um, I'm going to pick up on something that uh, Bob started in his talk, but let me first say that um, uh, Arvind was the reason that I came to Penn, and he uh, first brought me here on the uh, Sloan funding that Sue Davidson mentioned in 1981, uh, which was the first time I'd met him. And he brought me back in uh, 1986 uh, for a longer visit, and uh, I asked him where the money came from. And he said, um, oh, it's the Sloan funding and some other stuff that I've got. And I said, how could you still have Sloan funding in, in 1986? He said, oh, I hid it. <laughs> and it was one of the things that he was very, very good at, was keeping money for times when it was really needed to do something that wouldn't have otherwise been possible. And I learned that lesson from him, and I now uh, do the same thing with... <laughs> Uh, any funding that I can uh, get away with doing that with. Um, <clears throat> what I want to talk about instead is his uh, ongoing legacy and achievement. And I want to uh, single out a very abstract concept, sounding concept, it's actually very concrete, that Bob has already mentioned in his talk, namely the concept of mild context sensitivity. Because when Aravind responded to Chomsky's identification of the fact that human languages are outside the class that Bob identified as context-free languages, context-free languages 
are a, a computational class of languages which you can think of is, as the class of languages that arithmetic represents. And Chomsky was saying human languages are more complicated than arithmetic. Um, and uh, Chomsky's reaction to that discovery was actually to lose interest in any particular auto automata theoretic computational class of languages that would characterize just human languages, and instead to identify constraints on the universal computation from which it was hoped that a more restricted theory would emerge. Aravind's reaction was quite different, as Bob said in his talk. Aravind's reaction was to create a new automata theoretic class and a new class of grammars that was hoped to be just powerful enough, just enough more powerful than arithmetic to express the human languages. And this, of course, was tree-adjoining grammar um, that he and his students worked on for many years. Um, but Aravind did something uh, else in response to that same discovery, which was to define the requirements for any theory, not just his own, to be counted as an explanatory theory of natural language. And this was the concept of mild context sensitivity, that there was a layer between the context sensitive languages, like arithmetic, and the cosmic class of, of the context sensitive languages, which are, is, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's essentially everything that you could possibly uh, think of as a language, um, regardless of its resemblance to actual natural languages. Um, Aaron said that any theory that p claimed to be an account of human language should fulfill three requirements, and actually they were on Bob's slides, but I'm going to say what they were anyway. The first one was polynomial possibility, and all that that means is that there are nice programs that we can actually work with and make practical that will recognize and parse the, uh, lang the sentences of the language. The second one was a requirement of constant growth, which said that if a, if a language has a sentence of n words long, there are no big gaps between the next, the, 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 the next sentence, which is uh, the, the sentence uh, just longer than the one that you've already identified. So for instance, languages that have sentences of length of t the powers of two uh, do not obey this constant, uh, constant growth requirement. Um, this is the one that everybody hates, and they always try to disprove. And the argument that they use to disprove them is always a version of the Oedipus Schmoedipus construction, which is a construction that uh, allegedly allows you to duplicate a string two times. And it's called the Oedipus Schmoedipus construction because it is the subject of a famous Jewish joke about a Jewish mother who is told by the doctor that her son is suffering from an Oedipus complex and says, Oedipus Schmoedipus, what does it matter if he's a good boy and loves his mother? <laughs> and if you ask somebody who actually uh, speaks this dialect, and many of my relatives do, um, they will look at you with their eyes as big as saucers and they will say, this is absolute rubbish because you can only do it with words. And that's, what, uh, that's always the answer to an attempt to overthrow this requirement. The third requirement was the one that I want to actually spend some time uh, sharing with you the real definition of, because this is widely understood, uh, misunderstood. Everybody wants to be mildly context sensitive. It's such a good thing to be. Chomsky is mildly context sensitive, we are told. Um, <laughs> But this is actually based on uh, a, a misunderstanding of this complicated point. And it's Aravind's fault because he actually put this statement in two forms. In 1988, he stated it very vaguely as being that there was some limitation on the number of crossing dependencies. Dependencies are the relation between a verb and its subject. And you can have lots of verbs in a sentence and lots of subjects for those verbs, and this is a constraint which says uh, the verb, if you're separating verbs from subjects, you can do that, but you can't do it every possible way. 
And uh, Arabin first of all stated the con constraint that there were just some cross dependencies that you couldn't have. Uh, but later on, in a 1991 article with his students, uh, David Weir and uh, Vijay Shankar, he stated it quite differently. He said, um, languages that are permutation complete, which would mean that you could take those verbs and those nouns, the subjects, and per permute them in any possible way. So if you've got n words to arrange in a sentence, there would be n factorial possible ways of arranging them, the possible permutations. And he said the restriction on crossing dependencies is that permutation language, complete languages that consist of all those possible permutations are not possible human languages. And that was a very interesting restriction because it's a quite different way of stating it. And in particular, Aaron identified this as ruling out the language mix, which is an artificial language where you have, if you think of it as made up, a language made up of the word, of words of type A, words of type B, and words of type C, where maybe A are the subject nouns, B are the verbs, and C are, I don't know, adverbs or something like that. Um, uh, he said that if you have uh, N of those subjects, verbs, and adver adverbs, uh, you can't have the permutation complete language on, uh, on that. You can't, there are some of the n factorial permutations that are missing. You can't have them in any language. Fast forward to 2015, the 21st century, because all of that stuff is ancient history, and it has recently been proved that mix, the language that I just described to you, is in the set which is the natural generalization of tree adjoining grammars, which is a thing called LCFRS. It doesn't matter why it's called that. Um, and this is interesting because LCFRS had been identified as one of the ways in which we might identify the class of mildly context sensitive languages. And proving that mix is in that class LCFRS means that LCFRS is not equivalent to the mildly context-sensitive languages. And this was very upsetting to many linguists who had proved that their formula, form, formalisms were equivalent to LCFRS. Because what it means is that this class is also too big. And the implication of that is actually that uh, language, formalisms like Aravind's tree-adjoining grammar, which are much less than LCFRS, they're sort of just non-context-free. They're just more powerful than arithmetic and programming languages and the other artificial languages. Um, uh, the, res the result is that we should start looking at formalisms again, like Aravind's tree-adjoining grammar, to get an answer to Chomsky's original question, what characterizes, in computational terms, the class of human languages? And I'm going to close on this by saying that I know from talking to Aravind uh, more recently that he was working on this problem um, uh, to the very end. And he had a new generalization to replace the L LCFRS generalization, um, which had more attractive properties than that. And uh, I wish that I had been able to hear the end of that story from Aravin. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have a, a set of very short video tributes from people who are unable to be here. The first is from Chembo Shahin and uh, Denise Seyrik from uh, Metu in Ankara. Uh, can we roll? Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, this is from Ankara. Uh, we are sitting in a room where <coughs> Arvind met our PhD students. So when Arvin and Susan came over to Ankara uh, for a short visit, um, we organized a, a meeting with PhD students. <clears throat> and, and I left them alone with Arvind 
for about two hours. And then came back to pick him up for dinner. And as we went out, you could see the Arvin experience in, in the students' faces. So it was quite a unique experience for them. But it isn't a full work and no fun. We had a daily trip to Cappadocia uh, with Susan, Arvin, me, Dimit, and some friends. Um, and we stayed quite late. Uh, it was late coming back. Um, and on the way back, it was pitch dark and everybody was essentially sleeping except the driver. Um, and right, right about in the middle of the road, <clears throat> um, Arvin just leans over me and says, um, um, you know, there are some you know, examples which lead to interesting types in CCG. And then we, he said, you can take a look at these. And then he goes back to sleep with this mischievous smile on his face that we were all very familiar with. Um, uh, I will never forget that smile. Uh, uh, I couldn't sleep a week in the rest of the journey. And uh, actually I ended up writing a chapter about what he said in, in just maybe 30 seconds. Um, That was my unique experience with Arvin. It's so difficult to imagine Arvin not being around. I want to tell Susan, his daughters, and the entire family that I'm so sorry for your loss. We will miss him very much. My name is Kathy McEwen, and I'm a professor of computer science at Columbia University. Today, I want to remember Aravin for all he has done for me and for the NLP field. I would not be where I am today without him. Aravin took a chance on me when admitting me to the PhD program as an unusual student with an undergraduate degree in comparative literature. His advising style was enabling. He gave me input, yet the freedom to go in the direction I wanted. Most important, he listened. He supported me. As a graduate student, he put me up for awards and helped me get them. As a faculty member, he still supported me. He was there for me every time I needed to talk, and he continued to put me up for awards and help me to succeed. In many ways, he was a father to me in the way he listened, was interested, and encouraged me. And I have many siblings in this family of students who he launched into the world, all of whom must feel as I do now. So today, I feel a tremendous loss now that he is gone. I felt accepted into Aravin's personal family through many interactions with Susan, and I remember Mira and Shamala when they were young. I am reminded almost every week of Aravin in New York City when I get into a taxi and see the screen flash with Mira Joshi, taxi commissioner. I remember how proud he was when she was appointed. And I often say, to whoever is in the cab with me, that is my advisor's daughter. Hello, I'm Julia Hirschberg. I'm currently a professor of computer science at Columbia University, and I was one of Erevin's students uh, a long time ago. So I was very, very sad to hear of Erevin's passing, particularly since Barbara Gross and I had just had dinner with him and Susan a few weeks earlier, and we had such a good time reminiscing about old times and current times. Erevin was, and he still is for me, the face of NLP. He was ahead of his time in so many ways that really shaped our field. He was also a most kind and caring mentor. 
He was always there to consult about research or academic issues, to listen to ideas, and to suggest improvements one had never thought of. He was a very creative man. His Cognitive Science Center at Penn truly changed my life by introducing me to the many fascinating aspects one could study about language. And I do remember so clearly the dinners that he would host for the Penn students at conferences, which made us feel like such a part of the larger NLP community from our earliest years in the field. Much later, when Erevin received the first ACL Lifetime Achievement Award, I remember him saying he had mixed feelings about this since he had so much more research to do, and he certainly did do that research. So we will miss Erevin so very much, but he will remain a model and an inspiration to all of us who knew him. This message comes from Charles University in Prague, its Institute of Formal and Applied Linguistics. We want to join, at least at distance, those present at the memorial and to pay tribute to our beloved colleague and friend, Professor Arvin Joshi, an honorary doctor of our university. There are at least three points of intersection of professional interests between his scholarly work and our research, some of which go as back as to the late 60s. In those times, Petrus Gall and his collaborators in Prague formulated an original type of genitive description of language and one of the important issues was the discussion of the generative power of such a description. For us, Arvin's work on the so-called mildly context-sensitive grammar formalisms were extremely inspirational and supportive. Later on, when Professor Joshi formulated his tree adjoining grammar, we have profited very much from his insight on the relationship between his formalism and dependency grammar we subscribed to. And last but not least, and most important, especially for the young team working on this course, was his elucidation and application of centering theory and the build-up and development of the pen discourse tree bank. The content of this work laid the foundations for our collaborative project on discourse analysis and annotation and offered an unforgettable opportunity for me and my young colleagues to put our hands, so to say, on the Penn Discourse Tree Bank during our trips to Philadelphia and to enjoy the visits of him and his colleagues in Prague. I personally know Arvind from our meeting at Kohling in 1969 in Sweden having been in contact with him since then, first by exchanging papers, by occasional meetings at conferences, and then after the change of the political situation in our country in 1989, by regular meetings in Prague, in Philadelphia, and at conferences all over the world. I also vividly remember my stays in his and Susan's house and most enjoyable stays at the country cottage in upstate Pennsylvania. We all will terribly miss him as a mentor in our discourse studies, a very modest, kind, calm, charming, 
and most knowledgeable mentor. His passing away is a great loss for the whole community. He was a great scientist, a wonderful teacher and a remarkable personality. We all will miss him, but his everlasting kind smile will stay in our memories forever. Young colleagues that, he, that Ava was referring to, uh, let me turn the mic over now to Zach uh, to say a few words in closing. Hi, everybody. I'm Zach Ives. I'm the current chair of the Computer and Information Science Department at Penn. Um, I just wanted to thank, first of all, Arvind's family, uh, but also his collaborators, his colleagues, uh, for giving us a sense of the many memories uh, of Arvind, uh, perspectives on how he changed the field and uh, built the community and the department that we see today. Um, it's clear that Irvin will be greatly missed all around, uh, but it's also clear that all of us, everything around us, is greatly impacted by him. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Bonnie and Mitch, for organizing this event to have us all share in these memories. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who came from all across the world uh, to be here today to remember Arvind uh, and to pay tribute to him. Uh, and finally, I'd like to invite everybody to join us for a reception uh, downstairs. Thank you. Thank you.